This is the verse we looked at before fall break. Let's see if you can remember it. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be good, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Very good, guys. You, I'm, I'm just impressing because it's been a few weeks. Here's another one we did before fall break. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his, his what? Wealth. Riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Yeah, we looked at that one too right before the break. Today we're going to start looking at, uh, oh, I didn't take that out. We're going to start looking at uh, verse in Romans. Um, Romans is in one of the most incredible books in the Bible. Now that's dangerous to say because all the Bible is God's Word. But it seems like He has chosen to use this book. It seems to me, this is just my humble opinion, that he's chosen to use two of his books especially in people's lives to bring them to Jesus and to, to change people's lives. One of them is Romans and the other one is John, the Gospel of John and the book of Letter of Romans. They're both really, really powerful books that God has used in a powerful, special way. Paul wrote this, I believe, while he was in Corinth uh, and uh, maybe on his second missionary journey. might have been his third. I think he was on his second. I, I need to look all that up again. I'd lose track of that. But anyway... Uh, he had never been to this church. He'd never been to Rome yet. He was going to go a few years from this point, but uh, but when he got there, he wasn't going to get there the way he wanted to. He was going to be a prisoner, so he didn't wasn't totally free. Even though people would come and see him, and he shared the gospel with a lot of people in Rome. But he really wanted to get there. And uh, and by the way, he didn't start that church, of course, because he'd never been there. And a lot of people say, "How did that church get started?" And we don't really know. But do you remember on the day of Pentecost, just a short time after Jesus died on the cross and rose again, the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came. And you remember in those days, you're freezing, aren't you? <laughs> Let me see if I can turn it and fix that a little bit. Uh, in those days, uh, I don't want to make it too warm because I was burning up. I wore this sweatshirt you know, on the balls today. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's probably a mistake because I get hot so easily. But anyway, anyway. Uh, if you remember, and you may not, but, but you need to know, in the old days, in the Old Testament days, Jews really tried hard, and this was true in Jesus' day as well, to get back to Jerusalem three times a year. Once was for Passover, which was associated with the Feast of Unleavened Bread as well. Another one was for Pentecost, 50 days later. And another one was in the fall for Tabernacle. Passover was in the spring, Feast of Tabernacles and Feast of Trumpets in the fall. And so they, they tried to get back to Jerusalem to celebrate those festivals. So on the day of Pentecost, there would be thousands and thousands, many, many thousands. Some people say even maybe millions of Jews that came back to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. They didn't know Jesus. They just, they just knew they were coming to celebrate Pentecost. Feast of Weeks, the Bible called it sometimes in the Old Testament. But that's when the Holy Spirit came. And there was a reason for that. He came on the day of Pentecost. That was all prophesied and pictured in the, in the way God put these things together in the Old Testament. But the Holy Spirit came on the church then, and thousands of people got saved on the day of Pentecost. And many of them almost certainly were from Rome because there were lots of Jews in Rome. So they would come from Rome to celebrate the, uh, the, the Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. So the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm just certain God brought a lot of those people to Jesus. They were part of the thousands who came to Christ then. So when they went back home to Rome, they stayed together. We're, we're trusting Jesus now. And so they had a church going and they were learning as much as they could and helping each other see what the Old Testament had to say. They probably stayed in Jerusalem for a little while to learn from the apostles some of the basics of the faith. We don't know all those details. But anyway, Paul had never been there and he really wanted to get there. He said in verse 15, the verse before this, he said, I'm just eager to get to you in Rome. I want to get there. I want to share it with you. I want to learn from you too. And then he says, this is why I'm eager to get there. For I am not, this word means embarrassed, ashamed. Very good. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Very good. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And then he tells why he's not ashamed of it. For it is the Purpose. power. Power is good. Power of God for salvation. Yeah, the gospel leads to salvation. It's the power of God for salvation. You guys are doing so good. To who? Everyone, that's right, to everyone who believes. believes. Yep, to anybody who will believe. We're going to talk more about this when we get all the words. And then he kind of underlines this by specifying what the world then saw as the two main groups of people to the Jew 
first and also to the do you remember what the people were called who weren't Jews? Gentiles. Gentiles or sometimes Greeks. They call them Greeks. Some, some translations say Greeks here. But that's, but yeah, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And, and shame, shame means, I don't think I want to talk about this. Why do you think some people might be ashamed of the gospel? By the way, the gospel is just the good news about Jesus, that what Jesus did, what he came to do, who he is, and, and how we get eternal life by trusting Jesus, the gospel. He's not ashamed to talk to people about that. Why do you think a lot of people are ashamed to talk about that? Okay, because a lot of people just don't believe it, and you know if you talk to them about it, they're not going to agree with you, right? They may even get angry sometimes, so we may be a little bit afraid of that. Well, I don't want people mad, you know, so that's, 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 and they may also, instead of getting angry, what else could that, well, angry is part of it, I guess. If they get angry, what could that mean for you? If they could, they could, it's not fun, is it? You don't want to have people mad at you, do you? I don't either. They can ridicule you or laugh at you or tell you got off the deep end or you're a Holy Joe or a Jesus freak or something like that, you know, call you names. Uh, and so a lot of people are ashamed because of that. They say, well, I'm just not going to do it because I don't want anybody to get mad at me. Can you think of anything else why, why people might be ashamed to talk about Jesus? They want to fit in. I'm sorry? They want to fit in. Uh, yeah, they feel like, I, I, I want to be part of that group, and that group really doesn't make much of Jesus, so if I'm going to be part of that group, I better keep quiet about Jesus, and I want to fit in. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. That's a lot of people. It's not a good one, but it's a, it's a good answer. <laughs> the, a lot of people really want to fit in. And they want to fit in with their group so badly that if their group embraces sin, they're not going to say anything about it. They're not going to talk about Jesus. They're just going to kind of go along quietly and hope that everything works out. It won't. It won't be good if you're in the wrong group. But that will cause some people to, to be quiet. They're, they're ashamed. Can you think of anything else? Those are really good answers. I'll tell you another thing I believe sometimes happens, especially as you get a little bit older. You may be too young for this. But people are afraid to talk about Jesus because when you get a little bit older, they're afraid people are going to ask them questions that they won't be able to answer. They're afraid that they don't have enough answers to talk to people about Jesus. And it's probably true right now, especially if you don't have all the answers, do you? I mean, I don't have all the answers either. I've been studying this stuff for all my life just about. I don't have all the answers. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to have all the answers. I would encourage you to talk to people about Jesus. And if they ever ask you a question you don't have the answer to, all you have to do is say, you know what, that's a really good question. I don't have a really good answer for it right now. I'll get back with you on that. And then after later on, you know, you can talk to your parents or talk to your spiritual mentors or talk to your friends and, and, and maybe teachers, maybe your pastor, and say, hey, help me with this thing. Somebody asked me this question. I don't have the answer. And, and you'll find answers. You know, you just have to dig some for it. You may not be able to remember it on the moment, but you, you'll come up with answers. So that's another reason some people are ashamed. But in Paul's case... It would have been logical for him to feel ashamed because, number one, he didn't fit in with the Jews anymore. With everything you just said, he, he, he was considered an outsider. He was an, he was an outcast. They called him a heretic. He was a bad guy. The Jews felt that way. And, and almost everybody, when he said, you, you Greeks, your gods are nothing. They're just idols. They didn't like that. So, man, they, they, uh, they had all kinds of reasons to be opposed to Paul, and they let him know. I mean, they chased him out of their towns. They beat him up. He was stoned apparently to death and God raised him back up again he just went through all kinds of thrown in jail all kinds of horrible things because of his he knew the gospel was true and people didn't want to hear it some people do some people are excited about it because it's the power of God for salvation everyone who believes <laughs> it's good news but many don't want to hear it so you can see why Paul might have been ashamed but he wasn't and then he says, it's the power of God. You know, you might think, well, power, that means I get what I want, right? No, 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 no. It means we get what God wants. And what God wants us to experience, first of all, is salvation. So that's pretty powerful. He changes you, makes you into a new creature. You're not the old person you once were. That person's dead. You're a new person in Christ now. He's done that in our hearts. He's given us eternal life. He's forgiven us our sins. All, that's power. That's power to give us life to live forever. Yeah, that's called salvation. It's the power of God. And it's for everybody. It's not just for a few rich people. It's not just for smart people. It's not just for people who are part of the in crowd, the cool people. <laughs> no, it's for anybody who will believe. It's for all those people if they'll believe, smart people, uh, rich people, cool people. They can get saved if they'll just trust Jesus. 
But it's for everybody. The people who are no, nothings, nobodies. In fact, most of those are the ones that get saved. And God uses them in a powerful way. Everybody. It's for everybody. And then he underlined that by saying to the Jews, but also to the Greeks, Gentiles, the non-Jews. Everybody. The Jews first, that's the way God planned it. He, he did that. He, he chose the Jewish people in the Old Testament. And he gave his truth to them. They were supposed to take it to the rest of the world. They didn't do a very good job of that, but they were supposed to. And then when, but he, but he gave them his word. You know, he, he gave, rose, rose up, raised up prophets to write down his scriptures. And he gave them his word so that they would have his truth and they could share that with other people. And then he told them he's going to give them the Messiah through them. And he did. Jesus was a Jew. They, you know, he sent the Messiah through the Jewish people. And so when Jesus came, he said, I've come first to the Jew." But then, of course, he got, came for everybody. He came for us, too. He came for Gentiles, too. So uh, it was first to the Jews. God chose that from the very beginning, first to the Jews and then to the rest of the world. The Jew first, but not just for the Jews, for everybody. Awesome verse. Let's see if we can memorize it. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God. For it is the power of God for salvation. For it is the power of God for salvation. To whom? To everyone who believes. To everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's see if we can get to that. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God and to, for salvation. To whom? To everyone who believes. To the Jews first, and also the Greek. Amen. You guys did so good on that. I'm so proud of you. That's really good. It's a great verse. If you haven't got it memorized, you ought to work on it. It's a great verse. And we'll be looking at uh, some verses here in Romans chapter 1 for a while. Okay. Anything you want to ask, say, talk about, pray about, this verse, or anything else? Everybody good? Ready to pray? Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you for getting us through fall break. Apparently some of them had a difficult time in fall break. But thank you that we're back and you kept us alive and healthy and well. And we get to be here today. Lord, there's a part of us, some of us, that would think it would be nice if we're still on fall break. And uh, Lord, you know those feelings and you understand them. But you also set things up so that we have to have new beginnings and start fresh and, and work to do. And, and we have to be disciplined. And Lord, it's easy for us to want to be lazy and self-indulgent. And we don't want to do that. We want to confess that as sin. And we want to be uh, hard workers. We want to be disciplined. We want to be disciplined in our spiritual life, but also in our academic mental life and disciplined with our emotions. Uh, all of us. Well, we know that we can't be by ourselves. So we ask you to come fill us with your spirit and produce that self-control that only you can produce in us. We want to cooperate with you, the Lord. We know you won't, you're not going to do it in spirit. If we, don't, if we don't cooperate, but we, we certainly want to cooperate with you so that you can produce self-control in us so that we can get the work done. So in this class, for some of these kids, it means working really, really hard to learn these mathematical principles that they have to learn, to learn these procedures, to learn the steps, to learn the tactics for solving these problems, do some memory work there. Uh, and in other classes, they'll have other things they have to memorize and work on and study hard and get internalized so that they can do well with assignments and tests in other classes as well. So I pray for them all to to have that kind of spirit and attitude as we start a new quarter. Help them to do well. Lord, we want to we thank you for this verse you've given us. Thank you for the book of Romans. It's an incredible book. Thank you for causing Paul to write it down for us. And thank you, Lord, for uh, inspiring these words that he wrote. We know this is really your word. And we certainly want to agree with Paul and, and, and say, yes, Lord, we don't want to be ashamed either. If people call us names, if people reject us, if people put us out of the group, if people call us... Uh, uh, Holy Joes or Jesus Freaks, Lord, or if they call us uh, uh, hypocrites or if they call us uh, uh, off the deep end or whatever it is what they, they try to label us with, Lord, help us to not worry about that stuff, just to keep our focus on you and not be ashamed of the truth of the gospel, the good news of our Jesus. Because, Lord, we know you've made it very powerful. The gospel, if we've trusted Jesus for everyone who believes, it, it changes our lives forever. It gives us eternal life makes us your kids. And Lord, it can do that for everybody. Anybody that we talk to, anybody in our world, you can, you can bring them if they'll just believe, if they'll just trust Jesus. So I pray you'd help us never to be ashamed of that because uh, you're willing to use your gospel, the good news about Jesus, to change lives forever. 
Thank you, Lord, that because of Jesus we get to be in, with you forever in eternity, that we're going to one day have new glorified bodies when this life is over. We know, Lord, that someday we're going to be in a situation where all the stuff that seems so important, or at least a lot of the stuff that seems so important to us right now, is going to seem very trivial. Lord, we know that there are people who get hung up on cars and homes and uh, bank accounts and uh, popularity and coolness and uh, all this other stuff, Lord, that, uh, that one of these days is going to be so trivial. It's going to seem so trivial right now. It should. So help us to keep your priorities in our hearts and minds. I pray now as we approach math, uh, this, that these kids would learn the math they need to learn to get ready for the next test and help me to communicate it well and just be in charge of us and get glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay, let's see. I'm not sure if I stopped that video or not. Let's see. I guess I did. Good. Okay. All right. Oh, I just noticed I didn't change that. Let's see. No, oh, I didn't mean to close it. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thank you very much. Let's see. Let me get this back here. All right, now I think it'll work. Let me save that. Yeah. And we got to right here. I'm going to talk about this a little bit. And then uh, uh, we may get to the place today, we may not, but we may get to the place today where we can go ahead and start reviewing a little bit for the test, which is not, not this week. Uh, Maybe next Thursday. I'm not sure. Let's see. This is the 18th. I think it's next Thursday. All right. Oh, I need to click it though. <clears throat> huh, you know how to factor now. We've been using prime factorization. And that's a really good way when the numbers get very big. Like here's a fraction they're asking you to reduce. Those numbers are big. Now, it should be you could quickly think of something that would go into both those numbers, namely what? Ten. Ten goes, five goes into them also, but ten goes into them. So you can reduce it to 42 over 105 pretty quickly. Now, uh, I'm not going to insist that you do this any particular way. But let me show you what what they're talking about here and if you want to do it another way it's all right as long as you can get down to the right answer I'll, I'll, in fact I'll talk about another way in a minute that some of you may like but you remember how to do the factor trees remember the factor tree thing let's do a factor tree here 2 and 21 right it's an even number so 2 works and you know 3 goes into 21 and 7 so that 42 is 2 times 3 times 7 Still with me? Everybody want to say what I'm doing? Now I'm going to do 105 that way, the same way. What's the first thing you think of that goes into 105? Five. five, me too. And that's, when you divide that by five, you get 21. And 21 is three times seven. All right. So 42 is the same as two times three times seven. And 105 is the same as five times three times seven. So these cancel out and you're left with two fifths. Okay? That doesn't look like a two, does it? You see what I did? I factored the 42 into 2 times 3 times 7, and I factored the 105 into 5 times 3 times 7, and then I realized 3 divided by 3 is 1, 7 divided by 7 is 1, so they cancel, and I got 2 over 5. Okay? That's an easy way, I think, to factor big, big numbers. But if you if you choose, let me, let me just talk about this a little bit more. It's really the same thing, and it may be that some of you would like this better. 
if you say, okay, I've got it down to 42 over 105 because I know 10 goes into both those. I said, what goes into both these now? And, and I know I can do this, but, but 2 goes into this, but it won't go into this. This is not an even number. 5 goes into this, but it won't go into this. So I, admit it, I eliminate 2 and 5. I can't take them out. Will 3 go into both these? Well, 4 plus 2 is 6. So does 3 go into 42? Yes, it does. 5 and 1 is 6, so 3 goes into 105. See, I'm just going to divide both of them by 3. So you go over here on the side somewhere and divide 42 by 3. You might be able to do it in your head. 1 and uh, 4, is that right? 1 times 3 is 3. And 1 times 4 is 12. Yep, 14. So I divide that by 3. And I divide this by 3. 105 divided by 3 is 3. 3 times 3 is 9. 15. 35, 5 times 3 is 15, 14 over 35. So I've reduced it. But I'm not quite done, am I? Because there's a number that will go into both 14 and 35. What is it? 7. So when I divide 7 into both those, I get 2 over 5. So it's exactly the same answer. It's just another way of, another way of looking at it. So if you want to do it that way, that's fine with me. Come right in. That's fine with me, and that's probably the way you've been used to reducing fractions all along. And when they're smaller fractions, that's great. But if they get big, you know, if you see something obvious like the 10, go ahead, go ahead and divide both of them by 10. And then if you'll just factor each one with a factor tree, 42 is 2 times 3 times 7. 105 is 5 times 3 times 7. And you can cancel out all the common factors, and it's easy to reduce that way. So that's a pretty cool way when the numbers get big. I would encourage you to do it. Okay? Make sense? You with me? All right. Let's look at another one here. Are you all right? Miss? Great. We're great, Miss Melissa. Good to have you back. All right. Oh, I didn't get that erased, did I? So... Um, they're pointing out here that sometimes when you multiply two fractions, you get another fraction that can be reduced. Okay? 3 times 2 is 6. 8 times 3 is 24. Well, that can be reduced because 6 goes into both those numbers. 6 goes into 6 one time and then 24 four times. So you can reduce it. But if it can be reduced, here's the deal. M usually that means it can be reduced before you even multiply. We've done this before, right? Canceling? You remember canceling? When you look at a number like this, you can say, wait a minute, there's a 2 up here, and 2 goes into 8, so I can cancel that and leave a 4 down here. And these 3s, three goes into 3, and 3 goes into 3, leaves me a 1. So i got 1 times 1, which is 1, and 1 times 4, which is 4. And it's easier to cancel now than it is to reduce there. You see what I'm saying? It's easier to cancel first. So when you're multiplying numbers, always look to see if some some of these numerators will cancel with the denominator. It can it can be on top of you know can be right on this in the same fraction, but it doesn't have to be as long as one's on top and one's on the bottom. You can you can reduce it. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. We'll give we'll work some examples like that in just a minute. We'll do it right now. So this says use prime factorization. That's fine. But let's just remind ourselves, first of all, the old way. What number goes into both 48 and 144? Two. Everybody with me? You with me? Everybody with me? Two. They're both even, right? So why not just reduce it a little bit and get 24? Two goes into this 72 times. What number goes into both 24 and 72? Okay, you're getting ahead of me, but two certainly does, doesn't it? Two goes into 24 12 times. Or is that what you meant? Or do you mean 12 goes to both of them? 12 goes to both of them? Yeah. But let's go ahead and do this. True goes to 72 36 times, if you divide this by 2. And you've still got some even numbers. 2 goes to 12 6 times. 2 goes to 36 8. We've still got even numbers. 2 goes to 6 3 times. 2 goes to 18 9 times. And they're not even anymore, but now it's easy to see that 3 goes to both those. See? So that gives you 1 third. So that's one way to do that. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. What they're wanting you to do is say 48, do, do a factor tree, is 2 times 24. 
which is 2 times 2 times 12, which is 2 times 2 times 3 times 4, which is 2 times 2 times 3 times 2 times 2. 144, you might say, well, that's 12 times 12. That's good. That's 3 times 4 times another 3 times 4. And there's a bunch of 2's in there. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 2 is 4. So we got this one on top, 48. 2 times 2 times 3 times 2 times 2. We got this one on the bottom, 3 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 2 times 2. Looks like I got too many. Looks like a decimal. And then you can cancel stuff out. Those twos will cancel. These twos will cancel. Those threes will cancel. These twos will cancel. These twos will cancel. And you just got one left up here and a three left down here, which is what we got over there. So take your pick, whichever looks easier for you. If the, if the test says use prime factorization and you just want to do it this way, that's fine. I'm just trying to let you know either way works. It's perfectly fine. Ninety over three twenty four. Ninety nine times ten. Ten is two times five. Nine is three times three. I should have done that before, I guess. But there it is, all prime factored. Am I making sense? Three twenty four. Well, I know two goes into it. This looks like a, a kind of an awkward number, doesn't it? Two goes into that, 100. If you need to, go over to the side somewhere. One times two is two. Two goes into 12, six. Two goes into four, two, 162. Two times 162, that's even as well. So that's two times two times 81. I can't make an eight. Uh, it's kind of tough getting old. 81. And that's 2 times 2 times 9 times 9. And that's 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. See what I'm doing? So that goes on the bottom. This goes on the top. 3 times 3 times 2 times 5. 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. Is that? Yeah, 3. Mm -hmm. And you say, what can I cancel? Well... The threes cancel, another threes cancel, a two cancels. That's it, isn't it? So on the top I've got a five. On the bottom I've got two times three times three. That's 18, isn't it? Two times three is six times three is 18. So if you, if you try the other way, it will work. I'm not telling you not to do it. It's just going to be kind of messy, you know. This is maybe a little more systematic, but it works. All right. Well, I shouldn't have raised it. We're just going to skip this. The greatest common factor would have been what we canceled out finally. I think it was 2 times 3 times 3, I think. I'm not sure now what I was left. But, uh, yeah all the factors that are common to both of them. This says reduce before multiplying. You understand, you could say that 3 times 5 is 15 and 8 times 10 is 80, but then you've got to reduce that. So that's saying reduce first. That means cancel. 5 goes into 5 one time, into 10 two times. 3 and 8, you can't cancel that. So on top i got 3 times 1 is 3. On the bottom I've got 2 times 8 is 16. If you divided 5 into both those, you'd get 3 over 16. So, again, if you get the answer right on the test, I'm not going to be upset with you if you do it a different way. You could multiply first and reduce it, or you could reduce before you multiply. I just think it's easier to cancel. Yeah. What can you cancel here? I'm sorry? 5 and 15. 5 and 15. That's a good choice. You could have canceled 5 and 10 as well, but 5 and 15 is 1 and 3. What else will cancel? 8 and what? 12. 8 and 12. What goes into both 8 and 12? 4. Four so I'm left with a 2 here and a 3 there. Anything else cancel? You can use these numbers that you've already gotten. You can use them to cancel too. 
9 and 3. 3 goes into 9, 3 one time and into 9 three times. Anything else cancel? 2 and 10. 2 and 10. 2 goes into 2 one time and 2 goes into 10 five times. Anything else cancel? We never cancel ones because it doesn't really help. But what? Three and three. three and three. Three goes into three one time. Three goes into three one time. Wow, that's a lot of canceling. That's it, isn't it? So what's left on top? One. What's left on bottom? Five. five. So you got one times one times one up there, and one times one times five down here. That's it. So it's a lot easier to cancel if you multiply those together. You're going to get a really, really big number, and you're going to, it's going to be a mess, you know, trying to figure out. You're going to have to either factor it all. It's much better to cancel here. All right. Let's do this one. What do you see that will cancel there? Three and six. Very good. One and two. Anything else? 8 and 16, 1 and 2. Anything else? 2 and 2. 1 and 1. Anything else? I don't think so, do you? 5 over 7. Make sense? Yep. This is 1 times 1 times 5. This is 1 times 7 times 1. 5 over 7. Here's one more. It's kind of a big one. 36 over 45 times 25 over 24. All right, let's try to reduce some stuff. What comes to your mind? 25 and 45 will reduce. Okay. Five? You think about five going to both of those? Yeah. Five goes 25 five times and 45 nine times. Okay. What else? Okay. All right. 24. You said four? So that gives you six here and again a nine here, okay? Anything else? Nine and six. Nine and six, yeah. You could cancel the nine and nine. You know, they're, I know they're on the same fraction, but it's all right. You can still reduce it. But nine and six, we'll do that. Three goes to both of those. Now what? Three and nine. Anything else? I think we're done, aren't you? Aren't you? No. So you got a 1 times 5 is 5, and a 3 times 2 is 6, and that's it. Okay. It's messy when the numbers get big, but if you factor them like this and cancel, it makes it a lot easier, and it's kind of systematic that way. All right, let's see. Now we're going to divide, learn what it means to divide by fractions. They start by saying, how many one-fourths are in one? Uh, that may seem a little weird to your brain, but if I said, how many, how many threes are in 24, you would know that there are how many? Eight. You just divide 24 by three, right? Divide 24 by three. So it's the same thing with fractions. How many one-fourths are in one? We're going to divide one by one-fourth. And here's one, and here's one-fourth. And, of course, you can tell there are four of them there. Four of them. But that's the reciprocal of one-fourth. So what they're trying to get you to visualize is it to divide by four is the same, well, one-fourth is the same as multiplying by four. There are four of these in one, so you could, you know, to, to one times four will give you four. So to divide by a number is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. That's always true. And that's just their way of trying to help you visualize a rule that you need to just memorize and learn, and that is to divide by a number you multiply by the reciprocal. Uh, so, how many two-thirds are in one? That means one divided by two-thirds. It's the same as one times three over two. You remember the reciprocal? Flip the number, just flip it over. And that's just three halves, of course. Three times one is three over two. How many two-thirds are in three-fourths? Well, that means three-fourths divided by two-thirds.
the rule is you leave this one alone, you, f you change this to multiplication, and you flip this. Have you done this before in the math courses? Leave, change, flip. Did you learn that? <laughs> yeah. Leave, change, flip. To divide, multiply by the reciprocal. This is three-fourths times three-halves. Nothing will cancel here, so you get three times three is nine, and four times two is eight, nine-eighths. Your brain will try to trick you with a problem like this because you think, well, wait a minute, the two and the four will cancel, and the three and the three will cancel. You can't cancel when you're dividing. You've got to change the multiplication. Then maybe you can cancel, but in this case, you can't. It's just there's nothing to cancel. You've got to, you've got to change it. You cannot cancel when it's just written as a division problem. can't do that. How many three-fourths are in three? That's three divided by three-fourths, which is three times four-thirds multiplied by the reciprocal. Leave, change, flip. To divide is to multiply by the reciprocal. Now that's the same as 3 over 1. That's what 3 is, 3 over 1. So I can cancel this time. And 1 times 4 is 4 over 1, which is just 4. Yes, sir? Do, does dividing fractions always lead to an improper fraction? No, that's a really good question. But it doesn't necessarily. It, just, it happens to here. And that's a really good question. I'm glad you're observing that. That's, that's, that's good observation skill. It really is. But it doesn't always turn out that way. That's a good question. All right. Um, um, I'm trying to decide how many of these to do. You know that. We already talked about that. And you're not using calculators. This this is called a reciprocal key on a calculator. If you ever use a calculator, it's 1 over x is a reciprocal key. Um, all right, so we're gonna, we've got a few more problems here that we need to do. 3 fifths divided by 2 thirds. 3 fifths divided by 2 thirds is the same as 3 fifths. Don't ever change that first one times 3 halves, which is 3 times 3 is 9, 2 times 5 is 10. And there Thomas answers your question, see. We divide by a fraction, but we've got something that's a proper fraction. 7 eighths divided by 1 fourth. That's the same as 7 eighths. Don't change that first one. Times 4 over 1. Can you cancel this time? Yes, you can. 4 and 8. That's 7 over 2. That one's improper. 5, 6 divided by 2 thirds. It's 5, 6. Don't change that first one. Times, flip the second one, the reciprocal, 3 halves. Cancel? Yeah, very good. 6 and 3, 2 and 1. 5 times 1 is 5, 2 times 2 is 4. That's another improper. All right. Now, let's see if that's the end of that. Yeah. All right. What I'm going to do next is give you a handout so we can get started on this. Uh, guys, if you don't want to, let's see, that looks weird. I'm not sure why that's there. Um, if you don't want to keep these handouts, if you're afraid you'll lose them, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping most of you are organized and you've got a place to keep it where you won't lose it because we're going to be using them. Would you just take one, please, and pass them around? Another one. 
And you guys take one here and just pass them around. Just when you get through, just pass them over here. Um, if you want me to keep that for you so you'll have it when you come back to class, I will. But there's an advantage to you keeping it and making some time to work on that stuff at home and making sure you know how to do these things. So, uh, me. We're not going to get very far today, but we'll start it here. Let's see. Well, maybe we will. I don't see it open yet, but I can open it pretty quickly here. Let's see. Open. Yeah, I did the same thing again. Let's see. Slideshow, set up show. Where's anybody? Speaker. Save. Okay. <clears throat> so these are problems that will be similar, thank you, to what you're going to have on the test. Not exactly the same, but similar. So the, question, the answer isn't, you know, it's not a matter of memorizing things, memorizing answers. It's a memor matter of memorizing the strategy for solving the problem so you can do similar problems. 343 quills were carefully placed into seven compartments. If each compartment held the same number of quills, how many quills were in each compartment? Now, one thing you can do to solve a problem like this is to make yourself a diagram, if it helps. I'm going to talk about something else in just a minute, but I'm going to start with a diagram. Seven compartments. Don't worry too much if your drawing's not perfect. It doesn't have to be. But there's one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. Let me count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They may not be perfect, but there's, theoretically they're divided into seven equal parts. Okay? And altogether, they're 343. Altogether. So if you divide 343 into seven parts, how, many, how do you find out how many will be in each part? What do you do to figure out how many to put in each compartment? What? You divide. Very good. You divide 343 by seven. 7 goes into, won't go into 3, 7 goes into 34, 4 times, almost 5, but not quite. 4 times 7 is 28. Subtract, means we've got to borrow one here, 14 minus 8 is 6, bring down the 3. 7 goes to 63, you know how many times? Very good, 9. 9 times 7 is 63, 49. So there are 49 in each one of these. There's 7 equal compartments. All right. That's all. We already fixed this. I thought they were going to ask how much two-thirds of it was or something like that, but they, they're done, aren't they? Same number of quills. How many quills are in each compartment? That's what we just figured that out. If they ask you how much two-sevenths would be, you know, it would be two. This, this would be two-sevenths. And here would be five-sevenths. You know, if you, you could do that kind of thing, too. Just add those up. Or multiply 40 down by 2, multiply 40 down by 5. Yep. But in this case, they didn't. So, oh, I guess I ought to say this too. You, you don't have to draw this. If your brain looks at that and says, oh, I just need to divide 343 by 7 and get the answer, that's fine. You know, I just, I'm just trying to help you get the, the understanding of it, conceptualize it, as they say. But uh, you, you, can, you don't have to draw that unless they ask you to. Last year, the price was $14,289. This year, the price increased $824. What's the price this year? What are you going to do? Yeah. Very good. You're going to add. If it increases, that means it's getting bigger. You've got to know what the word increase means. It means it's getting bigger, which means you're going to add $824 to that $14,289. Be careful when you add. 9 and 4 is 13. Carry the 1. 8 and 2 is 10. Carry the 1. No. I already carried the 1. 8 and 2 is 10 and 1 is 11. Now carry the 1. 8 and 2 is 10 and 1 is 11 again. Carry the 1. 1 and 4 is 5. 1. Now you need to ask yourself, does it make sense? Does the answer I got make sense? And it, it's, it makes sense. This looks like it's roughly 800 more than that. You could, if you wanted to, you could subtract this from this to make sure you get this. That's one way of checking yourself. Or you could just re-add it to make sure you didn't make a careless mistake. 
The problem with re-adding is sometimes you'll make the same mistake twice if you just do the same thing, but it's still better than, than just not checking yourself. It's just check yourself. Try to make sure it makes sense. Write each number as a reduced fraction or a mixed number. Okay. 3 and 12 over 21. Do you know what to do? Yeah, reduce the fraction part. It's still the three still there. What goes into both twelve and twenty-one? Do you know? Three goes into twelve four times, and three goes into twenty-one seven times. So it's three and four sevens. Make sense? Everybody clear on that? What goes in both of these? Twelve. That's a, that's a. It's nice that you could see that. Who said that? Okay, good. It's nice that you could see that. If you didn't see it, you can still get the right answer, you understand, because you can divide by 2, and then you divide by 2 again. You know what I'm saying? Keep going until you get to the, the reduced. But if you notice that 12 goes to both of those, it saves you some steps. 12 goes to 12 one time, and to 48 four times. But if you didn't notice that, watch me now. Let's say you said, well, I know 2 goes to both of them because it's even. That gives me a 6, and that gives me a 24. And I know 2 goes to both of these because they're even. That's 3 over 12. And I know 3 goes to both of those. That's 1 over 4. You'll get the same answer. It's okay. You can take more steps. There's nothing wrong with that. It just saves you some steps if you happen to notice that the 12 works. 12%. How are you going to write that? 12 over what? 12 over 100. That's right. And now you just reduce that fraction. 2 goes to 12 6 times. 2 goes to 150 times. Still even, 2 goes to 6 3 times, 2 goes to 20, 50 25 times, and now we're done. Okay, I'm going to stop there today. We're going to keep reviewing next time. You've got a handout. Yeah, like I said, if you want me to keep that handout for you, I will. I just don't want you to lose it. Okay, bring it back next time because we're going to go some more. So keep have it with you next time, okay? Anybody, anybody got a question, comment, anything at all? All right. Don't leave. Don't leave yet. I'm gonna pray. <laughs> okay. All right. Everybody. Everybody. That's cruel to make an old man have to bend over like that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We sure will. She's got a bug of some kind. Yeah. Okay. We sure will pray for Lizzie. Thank you. Anybody? Anything else before we pray? All right. Father, thank you so much for these kids. Lord, they bless my heart. The way they participate so well in the in the Bible verse part of the first part of the class when they're learning your, your word and then the way they participate in the math part too Lord it blesses my heart the way they try hard they try to make their brains work they try to figure these things out so I pray you'd bless them for that bless them for their efforts bless them for their attitude and just bless them the rest of the day Lord help us all to represent you well and help us to walk with you through the day Lord you know that Lizzie's sick today not feeling well and we pray you'd give her some extra grace and peace and a sense of your presence and take away the discomfort and pain and, and give her healing as quickly as possible. And Lord, we pray that for others who may be sick as well. Thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen.